Um, again, my name is Greg Heckler and I'm the Western Regional Sales Manager for Desco. I've got 39 years of experience and I'm an ESD certified technician. Uh, today we also have Jeffrey Brake with us and he's the Desco brand manager. Uh, questions, again, you can write in your question anytime throughout the presentation and we're going to take a break for some answers later on. So again, let's start again, what an ESD work surface is. Now this will make more sense to you with the picture showing. It's any work or work area or any surface where an exposed ESDS susceptible device can be placed upon. And that could be a workbench, as you can see in the pictures here, carts, mobile carts, obviously, shelving units, trays. Uh, obviously these trays are very popular, especially in the contract manufacturing arena. Uh, foam, lots of people use foam to stuff uh, through hole components into circuit boards with. Uh, also, one of the additions that's been added to the 2014 revision of the ESD Association standard is that if another ESD surface or material is placed upon a work surface, that then becomes your work surface. So for instance, down here in the bottom here where we show a static shielding bag sitting on a mat, that now becomes the ESD work surface. So what does the ANSI standard say or ESD association standard say? say? It says an ESD work surface shall have a maximum resistance of one times 10 to the ninth or one billion ohms. And that's resistance to ground. On this little chart right here, you'll see that that is both for product qualification and compliance verification. So we're gonna get into that a little bit more as well. Notice also that there is no lower limit required. I'm gonna talk about that too. Okay, here's a good, here's a, here's a good example of that range or what the standard says. So when something falls into that less than 10 to the ninth uh, range, especially for work surfaces, now that's a dissipative work surface. So you can see we have uh, conductive, uh, which is less than 10 to the fifth, dissipative greater than 10 to the sixth to less than one times 10 to the ninth. And then for work surfaces, anything over 10 to the ninth would be out of spec. So let's talk about work surface grounding. All ESD work surfaces shall be grounded and they shall be individually grounded. So if you look at the graphic on the bottom left here, you can see how at the bottom, these work surfaces are individually grounded. We don't want a daisy chain work surfaces as in the upper drawing here. Once you do that, you start adding or multiplying the resistance as you daisy chain them in series. You also, if you own, if you daisy chain, if your ground falls off, now all of your work surfaces become ungrounded. Another question we get asked a lot about is, do you, should I have a one mega ohm resistor in my ground cord? The ESD Association standard does not recommend using a resistor in your ground cord. If you need resistance for personal safety, the best thing to do is use a GF, uh, GFCI uh, either circuit interrupter, uh, circuit breaker, or an outlet. Uh, and for example, that might be a stainless steel bench in a clean room where I'm grounding a very hard conductive work surface. Recommended ground points. Uh, the ESD Association standard recommends that you use your AC or building's equipment ground for grounding your electrical system. And this item over here that we make, this uh, ground hub adapter, that's perfect for doing that. I can plug that into the wall and I can attach all my ground points to it. So what does an ESD work surface do? It does a couple things primarily. One, it is eliminates charge generation as you slide or move your static sensitive devices across it. That's one thing. Secondly, is if I already have a charge on my component, it dissipates that charge safely away from that device or multiple devices that might be in a circuit board. And then third, this is another addition to the 2014 revision of the standard. It helps you ground isolated conductors. And those could be things like tools or packaging materials. So for instance, a pair of tweezers like this bottom left-hand picture, 
uh, they would be grounded when they're sitting on the mat or cutters or anything conductive. Uh, packaging materials such as ESD bags, bin boxes, tote boxes, all these things now would be grounded and they would be at equal potential. Some additional benefits of having ESD matting, or in particular soft matting, which is primarily what we're talking about today. It provides a, non, a nice non-slip surface. So in this upper right-hand picture, uh, for instance, that helps you uh, pick up small devices, particularly surface mount devices. It keeps things from rolling or sliding off your work surface, maybe in an X-Acto knife or your tweezers or something like that. Uh, it helps with shock absorption. If you were handling um, uh, disk drives, that type of thing, if you were repairing computers and removing disk drives, it helps with shock absorb absorption over, say, an ESD laminate. Operator comfort, if somebody's sitting there soldering and they're resting their arms on the front of their workstation, that helps also. Uh, we also have green matting, which uh, helps with ES uh, Rojas awareness. Uh, and then, and protection of your laminated worktops. ESD laminates are very expensive and regular laminates are too. So soft matting helps you keep from scratching those or damaging those. Uh, we're gonna stop for a minute. Uh, Jeffrey's gonna see if we have some questions. Do you have any questions? Greg, can Jeffrey? you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, so we have a question regarding a, um, the difference between a floating ground and a earth ground, which I would guess would uh, be like the third wire ground, and any reference to operator safety? Well, a floating ground in, in our case, or, a, it, well, first of all, your AC ground is a hard ground. That's a ground rod that's driven into the earth, and that's hard ground. Uh, floating ground in the case of ESD control might be something like equipotential bonding, for instance. Uh, a good example of that would be if I was repairing a copy machine and I took the cover off and then I unplugged it for safety so there wasn't any AC power. Now I don't have my AC ground anymore and I might want to clip my wrist strap to the metal frame of the um, copy machine. Now I'm at equal potential with what it is that I'm working on. And so that might be something you would consider a floating ground or maybe a bench out in the middle of nowhere with no AC power. I might want to ground my mat to the hard steel of the bench leg. So that's probably the best answer I can give you right now. Any more? Okay. Yeah, one more question. Um, how, how on a continuous run of material, how how many ground how often do you need to run, ground it okay so that's a excellent question too and we get this asked a lot sometimes people will want to roll out a whole mat uh, or a whole length of mat material which is typically 40 to 50 feet there is no requirement in any standard that says you have to ground in multiple places but we recommend multiple grounds for a couple of reasons uh, one is uh, depending upon the type of material, obviously the longer away from that ground point, the resistance could build up. And then secondly, is if you only had one ground on 50 feet of mat and you lost that ground, now that whole roll becomes ungrounded. So we, in, in our literature, we typically say about every 10 feet, but you can use your best judgment on that. Any others, Jeffrey? Okay. Sorry, Greg. Um, go ahead and go ahead there. We'll okay. answer these questions. Get, we'll get to the questions at the end. I okay. have a few more. No problem. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about some of the ESD work surface types that are available. Uh, our stat-free T2 Plus here, that's what we call a two-layer rubber. And this is one of the most popular mat materials out there now. And for, for a few reasons. One is rubber is probably the most durable out there. Uh, type of mat material. So it resists cutting and abrasion and all different types of abuses that you could put to it. Also, it's probably the highest temperature capability out there. So if you're soldering, rubber is the best type of material. Now I said two layer for a reason. You'll notice in the picture, the bottom of this material is black. So we have a black bottom ground plane and we have a blue dissipative top surface. That ground plane helps with charge dissipation. So two-layer rubber, 
If you are one of the best, that's the best material you can buy. Uh, three layer vinyl, another popular material. This material is equally as effective from a, from a static dissipation, dissipation um, standpoint, but it's a little bit softer, it's more economical, and if you're not soldering, this also makes an excellent choice. Two layer vinyl, this is a new unique material to Desco. It has the economy of vinyl, but it has dual layers like the dual layer rubber. So this also this makes an excellent choice for areas where aren't, that aren't abusive, maybe shelving, uh, uh, trays, that kind of thing. And then another material that we have, B80. This is probably our most economical material. And this I would say the best uh, application would be for shelf lining. Um, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll put a piece of mat on top of another mat to keep from damaging their uh, nice uh, bottom mat, which is typically vinyl. That's okay to do, but we also make a disposable fiber board like this black uh, mat here. So it's real economical. And if I uh, wanna keep my good mat from being damaged, I can buy pieces of that to put on there. And then when I damage that, I just throw it away. I talked about foam being a work surface. So we got multiple types of foam uh, thicknesses. We have low density, high density, but this is probably most commonly used to stuff through whole uh, components in. So let's talk about qualification versus compliance verification. This is very confusing for a lot of people. If you were gonna buy new mat material and you'd say wanna comp compare multiple types or maybe Desco to another brand and you wanted to do all that testing yourself, that would be qualification. Now keep in mind that qualification require, requires temp and humid, temperature and humidity control and you have to have multiple sample sizes. So if you can't do that, the standard allows you to buy pre-qualified materials and Desco pre-qualifies all their materials. So you can just do that based on our data sheets if you like. And so if you don't have to do the qualification, then you can just buy the pre-qualified. Um, as far as testing your work surfaces, testing is mandatory and resisting, resistance to ground is what you need to do or what we call RTG. All right, now in order to do that, you need the proper test equipment and that's what we call a surface resistance test kit. That's the kit that comes with the two five pound probes. Also the tester has uh, 10 and 100 volt uh, test currents, okay? And for testing dissipated materials, for instance, you test at 100 volts. Now, this now is uh, what we call compliance verification. That's when I put my qualified material into use. And when you do that, you want to follow the ESD Association standards ESD TR53 and the latest one is the 2018 revision. So as you can see down here in the bottom left picture, what I've done is I put my five pound weight on a section of the mat, usually in the center of the mat, and I clip my other test probe to ground. When I do this, now I'm checking the resistance from the top through the material all the way to the ground point. So I check my snap, my cord, my ground connection, and my surface. If that works, move on. If your mat should fail for some reason, I might wanna go and test the surface resistance, which is what we call RTT, or resistance top to top. But you're only required to test the RTG. As far as the test interval, or how many times you need to test your mat, there is no specific requirement for that. That is user definable. So many companies test quarterly, but you should test as often as you need to. Next slide. Okay, uh, ESD workstation monitors or continuous uh, wrist strap monitors have become very popular lately. And one of the benefits of these types of monitors is that you can continuously monitor your ground connection points on your mat. And one of the other things that confuses people is that if I install a continuous monitor, can I eliminate my RTG testing? No, you can't. Monitors do not test for surface resistance. They only monitor for the connection between two points. 
So on this diagram at the bottom here, you can see these mats here have two connection points. So the monitor is testing the resistance between these two points or a point back to ground. So if one of those ground cords would fall off, my monitor will alarm and let me know. But I still need to do my RTG. Now it's important to understand also that you need a work surface material that's compatible uh, with continuous monitors because that monitor has an upper resistance test limit. And typical uh, types of mat that, are, that you can use would be say a two layer rubber uh, or a three layer vinyl material. Uh, maintaining your work surfaces. It's very important that you use proper cleaners or cleaners that are suitable for use, such as Desco's Restore mat cleaner. You don't wanna use cleaners like Simple Green or Windex and especially cleaners that contain silicone because most, as most of you know, silicone's not good around electronic assembly, especially when it comes to the soldering process. So make sure you're keeping your mats clean regularly to, to maintain the surface resistance and use the proper cleaners. Um, Jeffrey's gonna uh, put up a poll question or, or has already put up a poll question for you to answer uh, some questions. Is that right, Jeffrey? No, it's, up it's up now. Okay. They should, everybody should see it on their screen. If you could just take a minute to, to read that and, and fill it out for us, we'd appreciate it. Um, we can also start, we, I have a few more questions. People can continue to write in questions here in the question forum. Um, and we will, we'll, we'll answer a few of them now. Uh, if we don't get to answering them now, we'll, we'll send you a, a, a reply via email. Um, so let's, uh, we have a, let, let's start with this. Uh, there's a question, can we use uh, alcohol to disinfect mats? Uh, that's an excellent question. And obviously in the last three weeks, uh, four weeks, we've answered this quite a bit. Uh, we do know that it takes at least a concentration of 70% alcohol or greater to disinfect. So yes, you can do it, um, but you may dry that matte material out over time and it could cause you problems with surface resistance over time. So you might just yeah. have to replace your mat more often. Yeah. What we do recommend to, to minimize that though, is if you're gonna clean with alcohol, then clean with the Restore Mat Cleaner uh, afterwards, and that'll help you maintain some of those electrical properties longer. Gotcha. Um, another question, can you comment about the differences between using an ESD laminate and using a ESD matting? Uh, well, yeah, another good question. Uh, obviously, we've been talking about soft matting materials throughout this uh, whole presentation, but uh, ESD uh, laminates, bench laminates are available. Um, we found, and uh, through the process of, of specifying matte materials, that softer textured materials um, have better charge coupling, coupling or charge dissipation. So both will, will eliminate a charge, but we found, and um, many of the suppliers of this material, that a textured surface makes a much better ESD control surface. So you can do the testing yourself, but that's what we've found. Okay, I'll, I'll take this one. Somebody asked on the fiber board, does it have to be grounded separately uh, from the, the mat? And the answer to that, no, you can, when you use the fiber board, if you use it on top of an already grounded ESD surface, um, it will couple with the surface. So you, you don't need a separate grounding wire for, for use with the wire, with the uh, fiber board. Yeah, let me just add to that, Jeffrey, because that gets asked quite a bit too, especially when we're in the field. As long as your RTG measurements are passing, that's all that matters. If it didn't pass, I'm a pass, I might then ground that fiber board individually. But as long as your RTG passes, you're good. Right. Anything else, Jeffrey? Um, one more. The uh, the. the there's a couple of questions actually regarding this, but the re the use of a resistor in a ground cord, I think you discussed that a little bit. Can you can you further expand on when and why there's a resistor in some of the ground cords? 
Uh, well, a lot of that started way back in the early days of ESD control when we basically had two types of work surface. We, we either had a black carbon loaded polyethylene mat, which was very conductive, or we had pink poly uh, anti-static mats. One of the days when people used to use black carbon loaded mats, they put a resistor in the ground cord for personal safety in case that mat would become energized. But we have dissipated mat materials now, and we really don't need to worry about that. Also, uh, one of the things is if when you have a dissipative mat material, you have resistance, it also minimizes that charge, so you might not feel that. Um, so there's other reasons too, but that stems from long ago in the original days of ESD control products. Gotcha. Jeff? Yeah. Um, we have another question about what's the typical life span of a, of a mat? I know that varies by material, but can you touch on that a little bit more too? Uh, well, it does vary by vary by material, but as far as something like a good quality uh, three layer vinyl or a good good quality two layer rubber like a, like a T2 plus, um, it's it's hard for us to say because, geez, I mean we get years and years of life. I mean, personally, I've tested our rubber materials out there for more than 50, uh, 50, 15 years, and I'm still finding good materials out there. It really all depends on how you're using them. If you were, for instance, if you were a medical device maker and FDA required cleaning with alcohol every day, obviously you're gonna wear it out faster. Or if you're spilling flux all over it every day, and having to clean. So a lot of it depends on how you can maintain that surface. But if it just sat there, it's gonna be uh, very rare that one of our work surfaces wears out by itself. Any other questions, Jeffrey? Yeah, uh, how about what kind of markings are necessary for ESD mats? Is there a requirement from the association and then what's What's Desco do for marking on their on their products? Well, this is a question that is very often looked uh, when it comes to setting up a static control program. One of the requirements of the ESD Association standards is that all ESD protective materials, and I mean those things like we make bags, smocks, uh, ESD mat materials, whatever, that they be identified as ESD protective. And most of the products that we make and sell, we do mark them, but not everything always is. For instance, like a pink poly bag, you're rarely ever gonna see any identification on that bag and or a black um, mat maybe. Um, so it just depends, a black conductive toe box. You're not always gonna find that, but it is a requirement that your ESD materials be identified. So when you're purchasing them, you should strive uh, to make that uh, one of your uh, priorities to look for. Jeffrey? Any more questions? Um, we have some questions here, but I, they're gonna take, we're, we, we're gonna have to, we'll probably have to answer these via email. There's a question about uh, where, where would you find copies of the standards that you mentioned? Um, uh, well, we have a link to the ESD Association on our website, and you can also, I put it up here, you can go to esda.org, and uh, when it comes to the uh, S2020 standard that I've been discussing and the TR53, those are a universal standard, and those are uh, free to download. There are other types of standards. For instance, I mentioned qualification. If I want to, if I want the standards uh, for qualification of individual uh, technical requirements, those you need to purchase. Those are copywritten. But S2020 and TR53 are free of charge. Anything else? I think oh. that's good. I, I mean, I think that's all the ones we can really kind of answer here. Uh, the rest of them, if we didn't answer your question, now um, we'll, we'll, we get copies of these at the end of the webinar, so we'll follow up with you 
in an email or in some other format. Um, Greg, your information is available here on the slide. So if you want to contact Greg directly, please do. We appreciate uh, that. That would be fine. Um, anything else, Greg? Nope, that's it. I want to thank everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. We had a big audience today. That was really nice. And um, yeah, feel free to give me a call or email me whenever you want. Thank you very much. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Greg. Bye -bye.